Welcome to Zoo Tours, the channel that takes you on a virtual field trip to the zoo. And if this is your first tour, I really recommend you hit all of those positive buttons to get free walkthroughs of America's zoos. Hello again from the Queen City Zoo, the land of famous pachyderms, buildings that have stood the test of time and a buttload of awards. Majority of them are thanks to the world of the insect. Insectariums are nothing new, but sadly they're so hard to find. What's not to like? You got bright colors everywhere, there's jump scares around every corner, and you can look at a bug and you can look at its ID and say, thank God that doesn't live near me. Back when Cincinnati actually tried to be the first at everything, bugs were no exception. They built this in 1978 and ended up with the first major and permanent insect house in an American zoo. I'm starting us exactly where we left off at Night Hunters. But before we get into bugs, right across from this sorry excuse of an exhibit is the Passenger Pigeon Memorial, the very last of the original Japanese style aviaries built for opening day in 1875. Since 1975, this exhibit has paid tribute to Martha, the last known passenger pigeon that actually passed away at the zoo in 1914. The walls paint an unfortunate picture of this pigeon's extinction and how such an awful event inspired both the government and eventually zoos to protect and preserve wildlife in need. So if you do make a visit, I recommend you don't act like every other guest and you actually go and check out this nationally registered historic landmark. To get to the insect house, go past the butterfly garden. If you've reached the lemurs, you've gone too far. If you've reached this building that looks like a bunker, you're in the right place. Every time I go through these doors, the very first thing I have to stop and do is admire this collage of 240 invertebrates to prepare you for what you're about to witness. The first section gets straight to the point. What is an insect? Besides the signage actually telling you, the first eight animals show you what's an insect and what's a relative. The green leaf or banana cockroach. The kind of roach that kindly stays out of your house. Dead leaf mantis of Malaysia will mimic a leaf so well they'll go as far as to fall on the ground like a leaf and play dead. The desert rainworm is actually a millipede that feeds on decaying plants and animals, therefore recycles good nutrients back into the soil. The brown recluse spider, which I don't think I've ever even seen, lives in the world's smallest library, towered by books that are all about them and the black widow. The zebra bug, another roach, has a beautiful pattern that warns predators that if you eat me, you will feel nauseous and your eyes and nose will burn. The white-eyed assassin bug's pattern does something similar, except they'll give a venomous, paralyzing bite to its prey. Now I'd say that's a pretty good small start, but as we move along, the bugs just keep getting bigger and bigger and better. Emperor scorpions. The larger, the safer they are to be around. The young kills its prey with venom from their tail, adults will crush them with their pincers, and use the tail for self-defense. If you are a fan of the beetles, the zoo has the Fab Four, taxi cabs, jade-headed buffaloes, emeralds, and magnificent flowers. It is beetles mania, but there's also an invasion of Madagascan hissing cockroaches. Unlike a lot of roaches, they cannot fly, and they're not poisonous or venomous. Their only line of defense is to imitate a snake to ward off predators. Lastly, some of you may recognize the cave whip spider. Unforgivable curses, anyone? They're just related to spiders and scorpions, so they still are an arachnid, but doesn't have the ability to spin webs or inject venom. What is an insect? Ends with a conversion scale that shows how much you weigh in insects. Even when you're told this, looking at that number will make you rethink your diet. Section two, success of the insect. Enlightens us in more ways of why bugs are unique in the ways they move, reproduce, and unusual life choices. Don't forget to look at the display cases right in front. There's always a line of well-preserved specimens who can no longer move for your sake. What's above them is very much alive. Giant African millipedes and the even bigger Hercules beetle. Their strength is equivalent to a 150 pound human being lifting a fully loaded Mack truck. In Cincinnati terms, that's one million cheese conies. No onions or mustard. The thorny devil is a heavily armored stick insect and if bothered, they'll either try to get you with their spiked legs and or release a skunk like odor. Section three, what insects eat. Doesn't show what they eat, but how they eat. Some chew their food, 
Others will pierce and suck, some will sponge, and others will siphon. Assassin bugs, speaking of which, don't just inject venom, they suck their victim's blood and any other body fluid it can. Sounds kind of similar to the Mexican red knee and Brazilian white knee tarantulas. Underneath all those hairs are two hollow fangs capable of a paralyzing bite. The venom will liquefy its victim's tissue and they can pretty much drain whatever they can with their straw-like mouths. Isn't that nice of them? The Texas bullet ant doesn't sound much better though. One sting won't kill you, but the 24-hour lasting pain has been described by victims or people who get themselves stung on purpose for views as what they imagine a gunshot wound feels like. The bullet ant's home is separated in two parts and connected by a tube that goes right into section four. Insects as food. This rose purpose is to show why insects are important to the food chain to be eaten by either birds, reptiles, carnivorous plants, and even us. The display railing is full of real commercial samples of all of the different ways humans can enjoy a protein-induced snack. The first creatures to give us a break from the bugs are blue spiny lizards and chuckwallas. And look, they're friends. Tucked deep into the wall is a Chinese crocodile lizard that I rarely ever see. Can't say the same for the Madagascar giant day gecko. Same with their mutually green neighbor, the rough green snake, on the prowl for mealworms, grasshoppers, and spiders. I don't think I've ever actually seen this ornate horn frog move, but they are determined eaters and will take anything that they can fit in their mouths. Other frogs, mice, and even birds. The Japanese fire-bellied newt is extremely cute as they are extremely toxic. Let's just say you decide to eat one. You'll suffocate and die within six hours. Though in human care, they're mostly harmless. The last spot was reserved for Emperor Tamarind back when it looked like this. The space was shrunk and now you'll be captivated by the big beady eyes of a black-breasted leaf turtle. They prefer shady and dark areas which then led to the development of large eyes and white irises. And never before have I seen a reptile do such a good impression of a puppy. Section five, defense and escape. Talks all about an insect's strategies used to survive and attack. There's live animals, but my favorites over here are the ones that are not alive because they're all unbelievably, spine chillingly, if that's even a word, huge. Up front and center and in the middle of the room, the Florida orb weavers speciality is well, you can probably guess, they're webs. Orb weavers are good at staying still, but not so much staying hidden. The less obvious invertebrates around these parts are the giant jumping sticks. Tough to find, unless you're like this guy who's blowing their cover. They look like a stick insect. I thought they were for all these years until I actually read the sign and it's a kind of grasshopper, a horse-headed grasshopper. Section six, insects in water is well, a line of invertebrates that like water. Marbled crayfish are classified in an order with 15,000 other crustaceans. Of them, they're the only all-female species that can reproduce and clone itself with unfertilized eggs. Giant water bugs are pretty much scuba divers. They can either breathe at the surface or from an air bubble trapped under their wings when they're submerged. Side note, the dads do the egg slash babysitting. Sunburst diving beetles are pretty much the same as water bugs, except the size and vibrancy. Those colors also tell predators they can eject a foul tasting chemical straight from their heads. Water scorpions. Now that sounds pretty cool and made up because it is. Water scorpions are part of an order simply known as true bugs, but they still can sting. At the section's end is a mirror to make sure that your hair is still looking right if let's just say you're on a zoo date. Oh, and there's also naked mole rats on the other side of it. One of the most insect-like mammals. Dozens and dozens live together in complex underground tunnels, and every chamber has a specific purpose. The colony is led by one dominant rat, the queen. Like some insects, only the queen is allowed to breed. Number seven, egg to adult. Only has two species, which are the Baja whip spider and emerald beetles. The rest of the area shows the progression and changes of a bug's life with preserved samples. Most insects start out as an egg. In this case, are either really, really small, I'm blind, or they're just missing. The next slide is a line of larva. Then the next shows those same species in their pupa stage. As time passes, they hatch or sprout into beautiful mature adults. 
So far, I've seen like two of these bugs at other zoos, but I have never seen a zoo with a trophy case, almost overflowing with 13 awards. 12 of them applaud the zoo for their efforts for exhibiting and breeding certain animals, and one of them is the AZA's Best Exhibit Award for Excellence in Design. The insect lifestyle section is all about a bug's different habitats and the many ways they can either be social or antisocial. The salmon pink bird eating tarantula flies solo, and if given a tank mate, cannibalism might put a damper on their friendship. If the blue death feigning beetle of America's Southwest is threatened in any way, they know to play dead, since their predators prefer prey with a heartbeat. Eastern lubber grasshoppers keep everyone else away by rubbing their wings together like the cockroach emit a sound like a snake's hiss. Giant walking sticks are the only bugs in the building that can pretty much do absolutely nothing and be virtually invisible, and I've lost count of the amount of times I've seen people give up trying to find them. Unlike them, the Peruvian fire stick doesn't rely on camouflage, but instead, again, uses their colors to openly warn predators of their rancid smell. Dragon-headed katydids. A bush cricket is named for their spiky spines and incredibly strong mandibles. So strong, they've been known to break the skin of a human's hand. This room also has a cicada display. No, not real ones. That would be awful. Rather, it's a very detailed model of a cicada's life cycle. It covers their beginnings, their songs that drive everybody crazy, how they start future generations, and then the cycle goes on repeat. The back wall even gives you a heads up of when and where different broods will emerge from the ground. Lastly, some of the animal kingdom's hardest workers, leafcutter ants. Millions and millions of leafcutter ants, and their realm doesn't end here. It just keeps going on and on and on and on you're actually looking at the exhibit backwards you know they cut leaves so the process begins at the building's end when shearing a forager's jaw vibrates a thousand times a second generating high frequency sound waves that stiffens the leaf and makes it easier to cut let's just say if their mouths become too dull to cut they'll switch jobs with a carrier that can handle leaf fragments over 20 times their body weight. And no, they don't eat it right away. They don't use it to decorate a nest or to impress a mate. They hitchhike all the way back to the first exhibit, cut the leaves up even more, and give it to a type of fungus. In return, the fungus then breaks down the plant even more to produce edible structures so the ants can enjoy. In what I call the tube room, you can enjoy the insect-related work of Cincinnati's own Charlie Harper. And I wish I could show you the butterfly aviary that's been closed since 2020, but you can still read about it and see other pictures below. And that, wow, that was a lot. That is what many of us zoo fanatics call America's greatest insect house. I'd ask where it sits on your list of insectariums, but I think the list would be a little short. Next time we're in the Queen City, we'll take a quick stroll down the hill to look at their dragons. So stay tuned. Hope you at least learned one thing today about the underappreciated world of insects. See if you can answer this episode's trivia question. And thank you for watching.